we moved there. So I'd get men, sit around a table. And I'd turn to the one on my right and say, if Jesus were to walk in the room right now, what do you think he'd say? And they'd go, oh, I think he'd say. And I'd go to the next one. We'd go all the way around the room. And after we got all the way around the room, I'd say, do you realize that you all just prophesied? And they're like, oh, it's that easy. <laughs> See, when you strive is when you miss it. Yeah. It's when you relax in who you are, abiding in presence, abiding in his voice, it becomes very natural to speak words that are life-giving. So we've, we've got to applaud. You know, Chris does an amazing job. He'll take like a room like this. He'll pair you off and he'll say, all right, everybody on the right, give a word of knowledge. In other words, something you couldn't know in the natural about the person you're faced off with. At the end, we'll ask the question, you know, how many of you got it right? They raise their hands. Everybody claps. He says, how many of you got it wrong? They raise their hands. Everybody claps. You know, we're not talking about moral failure. We're talking about, as leaders, we have to create an environment where risk is applauded, knowing that eventually there will be breakthrough, as long as you stay accountable. It's theologically immoral to allow an Old Testament revelation of God's nature usurp and surpass the clear manifestation of the Father's nature as found in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, your questions about God, the questions that every one of us have, none of them have the authority to cancel a revelation. The other day about truths, and they're superior truths. There are things that are absolutely true, but there are things that are more true. The judgment of God is true. The mercy of God is more true. Sin is a reality. His love covers a multitude of sins, so it's more true. Anything that you know about the nature of God that is not seen in the person of Jesus is an inferior truth. A prophecy is spoken publicly or written or released publicly because if, if whatever degree it's proclaimed at, the word ends up false or wrong. Let's call it wrong. False sounds like you got a demon or something. He missed it. He just missed it. I think that if you miss it, you, sh you must have the integrity to acknowledge it. And it may not get to everybody who heard the wrong word, but it's out there. I think we have to do that. I think that prophetic people that don't do that, it just, it's not good. <laughs> you know, and I will, I've, I listen to people who, who have said wrong things. And I still am open to hear them. I don't write them off because they said something wrong. Again, because in the Old Testament, the idea is that if you said it wrong once, you're false. And that's an Old Testament, that's true. But in the Old Testament, there were a very small amount of prophets in the whole world. And they're all in Israel. There's a, for the whole globe, they're a very small number. And they heard direct, audible voice words or open visions or an angel came, something like that. But in the New Testament, they, uh, we prophesy by faith. There's impressions, not only by faith, but there's impressions. That's why 1 Corinthians 14 says the prophets have to judge and discern each other. So we judge one another because there are some things said wrong. And, and we've tried to do that over the years. We've had some different things that have said over 30 years, and we've put out statements and said this was wrong. And you know what? We're not quitting, but the guy said it was wrong. It's not a big deal as long as we own it. Now, we don't want to be frivolous about it, saying it's not a big deal, but I mean, it's not a game breaker. You're not out of the ministry. If, if Deuteronomy 18.20 says, the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Okay, mm -hmm. we, we, we know that's not, okay, we're not going to be killing anybody. <laughs> okay, but God, his character doesn't change. It, it clearly really angers him when somebody says a word that was not from him. How do we know? How do we know what's from him and what's not? How does the person who is speaking the word know that he truly is hearing from the Lord? And how does everybody else who heard the, the person who's given the word, how do they say mm, yes or no? I've done a, a workshop on... Um balancing prophetic prophetic revelation with responsible pr principles of responsible biblical interpretation uh, for this very reason i think 
if somebody feels like God's inspiring them or showing them something and they think it's a word from the Lord, how, how do they know that? And how do other people test it? Um, just backing up a bit, I see a difference between Old Testament prophets, thus says the Lord, who were stoned if they were wrong, and the New Testament gifts where Paul says to uh, test the prophecies, keep what's good, throw out what's bad, um, where where there's not the same, um, you know, it's like, the if you encourage people to step out in faith and use their gifts, uh, chances are uh, it's not going to be 100% pure all the time. And so that's why he says, test the prophecies, make sure. Now, the responsible interpretation, there's so many uh, Christians that are biblically illiterate, or even if they read the Bible a lot, they don't know how to understand how to interpret the Bible. I have a, a doctrine test that's been very helpful to me in this regard. The doctrine test, there are three categories of, of pe ways people use uh, scripture to prove a doctrine. One is explicit. The scripture explicitly says, like the atonement of Christ for the sins of, of the world and all who respond, you know, uh, Christ died for our sins, explicit, no question. And he rose from the dead, explicit, no question. So no problem there. Implicit means clearly provable from Scripture, like the doctrine of the Trinity. There's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Spirit. There's one God, and yet three distinct persons in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, clearly provable from Scripture, implicit. The third category, and this is where so much division and so many heresies and weird things happen, is speculation. Does the Scripture actually say that? Or, or could the Scripture be interpreted several different ways? For example, the Restrainer in Second Thessalonians chapter mm -hmm. two. Uh, many Christians interpret that to be the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, others interpret it to be uh, Roman government. Right. I think you could make an interesting case that it could be the Archangel Gabriel using, you know, his role in the Book of Daniel, and uh, I mean Michael, the Archangel Michael who opposed the Prince of Persia. Um, I think you could make some interesting cases, but bottom line, it's speculation. So you can't really build a doctrine. You can say, I think it can mean this, but you don't build anything on top of it because if you do, it's a deck of cards that, you know, it's a, a house of cards that could crumble. So you only build doctrine on what's explicit and implicit. I find that that, eradicates almost all the heresies that are out there in the, that are seeds of heresy in the church today. People are taking things that are not doctrinally explicit or implicit. They're just speculation, and they're building on top of it, creating lots of confusion, lots of division. Hmm. I think uh, people, there need to be far more training in how to interpret the scriptures. Uh, I recommend a book by um, Gordon Fee, and I forget Stewart's first name, but Reading the Bible for All It's Worth. It's really helpful. Uh, Gordon Fee is a Pentecostal theologian, brilliant guy. He wrote the uh, commentary, probably five inches thick, representing 30 years of research and teaching on, the, on 1 Corinthians very biblically solid and balanced. And I think, you know, there are a number of principles of biblical interpretation that all Christians need to be trained in. And the problem in the so many of the charismatic circles is anything that's supernatural, people jump on, you know, like, wow, supernatural. But as we know, 
in that same chapter you talked about in Deuteronomy 18, uh, not everything supernatural is good. Uh, we're warned to stay away from all kinds of things that are spiritual but evil. Mm -hmm. So how do we discern? So learning principles of interpretation, balance is another one. Uh, don't take one scripture and forget all the others that may qualify that scripture. Um, I don't, I don't want to make this confrontational by any stretch, but uh, I'm curious. You brought up um, Paul speaking about testing the prophets, yeah, uh, and and um, testing just, prophecies. Testing prophecies. Where did you find that? Isn't that in First Thessalonians chapter five? Did okay, I? that's what I thought you were going to say. So the t test all things, hold fast to that which is good. Uh huh. Oh. Well, I think um, I wouldn't agree that just asking people what they think Jesus would say is is prophecy. I, I think I think what he's saying is uh, well. Let me let me put it this way, and I don't want to put words in in his mouth, but. I would say a general, a, a foundational, not, that's the wrong word, but when you have a quiet time and you're reading the scriptures and God inspires you and speaks to you through a scripture and you share that with somebody, I think that that's the closest I would say. I don't think, I, I don't think I'd agree with how he put that, that uh, what would you, what do you think Jesus would say? I think he would say, "Give me a hamburger." I mean, you, know, I, I, but I do think the Holy Spirit can inspire people to share words of life and encouragement and comfort and blessing. I think some preaching is prophetic, not foretelling, uh, not, but where the Holy Spirit has something on God on God's heart that he inspires through the word for a preacher for a preacher to say if we don't have that dynamic uh, of the holy spirit through preaching then preaching is reduced to teaching only uh, i think some preaching is teaching some preaching is pastoral and some is prophetic in the sense that god has something really on his heart that he wants to convey to people. That doesn't mean that the person sharing is a prophet. It means that the Holy Spirit decided to enter in, in, in prayer, uh, a word or a thought or, or something to edify the people. So, yeah, that's, I get very uneasy when I hear a prophetic uh, claim to be a prophetic utterance from the Lord where it says, Thus says the Lord, or whatever. God just told me, or I have a word for you, brother. Or yeah. <laughs> I, much better if you feel like God's inspiring you to share something to say. You know, I feel like God may have given me something to just share with you, and you you be the judge. You know, something really humble where you're not attributing to yourself some office, some self-aggrandizing office. Uh, you're giving people. You know, if, if, if it rings true and they said, yeah, wow, that's amazing, you know, then, you know, okay, God, use me here. If you want access to complete conversations and interviews that I've done with other people, as well as written articles, either my, by myself or articles I'm accessing for further research, or if you just want to get in front of the line for Q&A, check out our Patreon page in the link in the description down below.